Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Section 2 of Chapter 3 of Pierre Adot's Philosophy as a Way of Life is called Learning to Dialogue, and it focuses primarily on Socrates and Plato, but really what he has to say here runs throughout the notion of philosophy as a way of life and specifically the spiritual exercises, the matrices of spiritual exercises in ancient philosophy that he's concentrating on in this, this chapter. And so, you know, it makes sense that we would talk about Socrates because he's so absolutely central in early, early ancient philosophy in the West. He says that the figure of Socrates causes the practice of spiritual exercises to emerge into Western consciousness. For this figure was and has remained the living call to awaken our moral consciousness. And, he, and then he goes on and he says, we ought not forget that this call sounded forth within a specific form, that of dialogue. And it's worth reminding ourselves that Plato is not the only person to have written Socratic dialogues, dialogues that are, you know, recording in some sense, very often with some, some modifications, we, we think, the things that Socrates actually said and asked and engaged in with, with interlocutors. Xenophon, we, we certainly have plenty of his material as well, but we know that others wrote dialogues, even you know, to such a degree that there were quibbles about which of them were genuine and which ones weren't, if we look at Diogenes Laertes. Plato is the largest body of these that we have. And, you know, a little bit later in this section, um, Ado is going to say the borderline between Socratic and Platonic dialogue is impossible to delimit. The Platonic dialogue is always Socratic in inspiration because it's an intellectual and in the last analysis a spiritual exercise. So it's not as if we can neatly extricate the real Socrates from Plato's Socrates or anything like that. We don't need to because in part we're looking at what people made of Socrates and that's, that's what's, what's really particularly important. Now in the Socratic dialogue, what Ado stresses as absolutely central, and I think he's, he's dead on with this, is saying that the Socratic dialogue is not just what is talked about, but who is talking. The characters matter. The way that they engage with each other matters. It's not as if we have to say, well, we learn everything about the history of these characters and then we import that wholesale into here because Plato is, of course, you know, engaging in some literary uh, interpretation of them. But the way that they talk, the, the things that they're willing to think about and not think about. Prime example of this would be looking at, say, the Mino, in which Mino himself, who's a friend of Socrates, and who at a certain point is like, man, I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. I've talked about virtue so much before Socrates, it's like you took my brain away. He talks about him as stinging him and paralyzing him. He is willing to learn. He wants to know what's you know going on. He wants to see if Socrates can help fill him in. And he also is willing to say, oh man, I don't know what I thought I, I knew. If we contrast that to the young man who would later on bring Socrates up on, on capital charges, Anatus, and his engagement in the dialogue, he shows himself as a different sort of character, um, threatening Socrates at, at the very end in a prescient way. Right? So that's a very important thing, not just what's talked about, but who is talking, what kind of person they are. Now, I think that Ado goes a little bit far in telling us 
that in a Socratic dialogue, Socrates' interlocutor doesn't learn anything and Socrates has no intention of teaching him anything. He repeats that uh, the only thing he knows is that he does not know anything. Um, you know, that's there in some of the dialogues, but I think that's a bit of a overstatement there. If you read, you know, Socratic or Platonic dialogues, you do see Socrates and his interlocutor at many points saying, well, we know this at least, right? And we know this at least. We just don't know what courage is or what virtue is or whether it can be taught or these sorts of questions. But there's a lot of ancillary knowledge that's floating around. And, you know, Socrates is doing some covert teaching, you could say, in, in some respect, certainly at least by the idea of jarring people's memories and guiding them towards, you know, bringing things out of the depth of whatever uh, unconsciousness into consciousness. There is a very important effect, though, that Addo signals, which is that of calling people's attention to themselves in ways that then prep them for being able to do philosophy. Like he says, like an indefatigable horsefly, Socrates harassed his interlocutors with questions which put themselves into question, forcing themselves to pay attention to and to take care of themselves, right? And he says, Socrates' mission consisted in inviting his contemporaries to examine their conscience and to take care for their inner progress. And, you know, there's a lot of descriptions about what happens when this takes place. Um, you know, Mino uh, thinking about, oh, man, I've been talking about virtue this whole time. I guess I don't know what it is. I, I really need to attend to that. Some of them are a little bit more dense, like Euthyphro um, does seem to be a bit puzzled, but has no problem going off to, you know, bring the lawsuit against his, his father for uh the death of a slave, even though he's going to be considered impious as a result. Some become hostile with Socrates, um, but many of them are willing to at least realize that things are not as good as they ought to be. So in Plato's Symposium, prime example of this, Alcibiades describes the effect made on him by dialogues with Socrates, saying that he left him in such a state of mind, I felt I simply couldn't go on living the way that I did. He makes me admit that while I'm spending my time on politics, I'm neglecting all the things that are crying for attention to myself. So, so dialogue has the potential, when people are being genuine in it, of really, you know, bringing people's attention to where they currently are, which may be uncomfortable for them. Ado goes on to say that Socratic dialogue can be understood as a communal spiritual practice. Now, isn't that an interesting way to talk about it? Engaging in dialogue itself is a spiritual practice. It's one that, of course, as we're going to see a little bit later on, really depends on the interlocutor. You can't have dialogue with everybody. And you can also have dialogue with yourself and you can also dialogue with other people's dialogues. And this is where we come to talking about Plato. Just before that, though, he says, in a Socratic dialogue, the, the interlocutors are invited to participate in such inner spiritual exercises as examination of conscience and attention to themselves. They're invited to comply with the dictum, know thyself. And what does that mean? Ado says that knowing yourself invites us to establish a relation of the self to the self, which constitutes the foundation of every spiritual exercise. Now, why is that? Because spiritual exercises are things that we do on and to and with ourselves. We're not doing them to somebody else. That's like making somebody else do exercises. That's not ourselves doing exercise. And so dialogues, can be understood as occasions for getting people to, to actually do that sort of thing, which are often un uncomfortable, <laughs> even painful um, and frustrating. Now he, he goes on and he tells us, um, platonic dialogues are model exercises. They're models in that they're not transcriptions of real dialogues, but literary compositions, which present an ideal dialogue. And, and at that point you might say, oh, well, you know, then wouldn't it be better just to have the real dialogues? Real is always better than ideal. No, there's something gained in the process. 
Plato's dialogues allow us to be involved with, you know, you could say sit at the feet of Socrates, but Socrates is not a guru, right? Socrates is somebody who allows us into the conversations of Plato aiding him to, you know, look at what's being said and to think about how it applies to ourselves and our situation and to be ourselves called into question and also at certain points to say, wait a second, Socrates, that's a bad argument, right? So there's a lot that, that it makes possible. He says, they're exercises precisely insofar as there's dialogues. These are an itinerary of the thought whose route is traced by the constantly maintained accord between question and respondents. A little bit later, he tells us that within a platonic dialogue, um, there's a lot of things that the modern reader often doesn't have patience with. He says, um, all the circles, detours, endless divisions, digressions, and subtleties which make the modern reader of Plato's dialogues so uncomfortable are destined to make ancient readers and interlocutors travel a specific path. Thanks to these detours, with a great deal of effort, one rubs names, definitions, visions, and sensations against one another. One spends a long time in the company of these questions. One lives with them until the light blazes forth. So the act of actually reading and thinking through platonic dialogues is spiritual exercise, is it not? Now, there's two other really key things that come out of this discussion of dialogue in Ado. One of them has to do with the relation of oneself with oneself. And by engaging in dialogue with others, according to Ado, we learn to engage in dialogue internally. And this is uh, central for spiritual exercises, he says. Going a little bit back, he says, if we can trust the portrait sketched by Plato and Aristophanes, Socrates, master of dialogue with others, was also a master of dialogue with himself and therefore a master of the practice of spiritual exercises. Now, let's pause on that for a moment. Why would being a master of dialogue with yourself be equivalent to being a master of spiritual exercises? Because spiritual exercises are not something that you just get passively from somebody else and then jump to it and you know think the things that you're supposed to think or say the things that you're supposed to say or do the things that you're supposed to do. They are you using whatever you want to call it, your will, your faculty of choice, your pro racist on itself, on you to make yourself do certain things. This is why, you know, we, Foucault called these technologies of the self, I think quite rightly. You are using techniques that, that apply to yourself. And a lot of that, part of what Addo really brings out quite successfully, a lot of that involves linguistic or cognitive aspects. You talk to yourself. These days we have the term used in therapy, self-talk. Usually we're bringing that up in, in light of, oh, knock out the negative self-talk about, oh, I'm such a loser, I'll never be able to give a good speech. Dialogue is indeed self, dialogue with oneself is self-talk. Could be negative, could be positive, it could be interrogative, it could be all sorts of things. Socrates is a master at that, and in order to be good at spiritual exercises, you do have to have sort of an interior, not monologue, dialogue with yourself. So, you know, we've got all sorts of examples of this. Ado goes on and says, meditation, the practice of dialogue with oneself, seems to have held a place of honor among Socrates' disciples. When Antisthenes, founder of the Cynic School, was asked what profit he derived from philosophy, he replied, the ability to converse with myself. The intimate connection between dialogue with others and dialogue with oneself is profoundly significant. Only he who is capable of a genuine encounter with the other is capable of an authentic encounter with himself, and the converse is equally true. This is an absolutely important point, and this leads us to the second thing, the dimension of the interlocutor. Dialogue is not dialogue if it's merely monologue talking at, right? Um, and so at a certain point, there has to be engagement between the people. So some, you know, where, where you have passages where it's Socrates saying something and then it's Glaucon saying, wow, Socrates, that's so clever. Wow, that's great. Yes, indeed, Socrates. It's not dialogue at that point, is it? There has to be 
some, you know, engagement with an interlocutor who could call you into question, who could say, I don't, I don't buy into it, who could walk away from the encounter. There has to be this capacity for risk, and that's what keeps dialogues, like he says, from becoming a theoretical dogmatic expose and forces it to be a concrete practical exercise. The point is not to set forth a doctrine, rather to guide the interlocutor towards a determinate mental attitude. This is a combat amicable but real. And then this is very important. There has to be an engagement of the self with the other. You could say, using contemporary terms, that this is an existential engagement, an engagement of the meaning of one's existence, where one commits oneself. Socrates does this all the time. And he does it in the ways that he presents his views. He also does it in how he talks with others. We come back to who is talking. I want to know not just what you think, but how it applies to your life. Are there discrepancies between these sorts of things? Or is everything on, on point? Ado says, uh, in spiritual exercises, we must let ourselves be changed in our point of view, attitudes and convictions. Um, so we have to be open to that sort of thing. There has to be a possibility of conversion. We have to be motivated by a desire for truth, not just a desire to be right, not just a desire to win, not just a desire to have things easy for ourselves or secure or something like that. At the very end of this section, he says, as a dialectical exercise, the Platonic dialogue corresponds exactly to a spiritual exercise. The dialogue guides the interlocutor and the reader towards conversion. And this has to be motivated by a desire for truth. He says, in fact, the dialectical effort is an ascent in common towards the truth and towards the good, which every soul pursues. And then he says, furthermore, in Plato's view, Every dialectical exercise, because it's an exercise of pure thought, subject to the demands of the Logos, turns the soul away from the sensible world and allows it to convert itself towards the good. Uh, does that apply to every other philosophical conception? No, but a lot of this will apply not just to the Platonist school of philosophy, but to other Socratically inspired schools as well, and can go on down to the present, you might say.